Okay, more Unconditional Surrender League game stuff. Let's look at where my games are. I've currently got two games running. One from the first round against Sotokahu, a, def a historical defence. One against Rondom from the second round, a long opening. We'll start with the Rondom game. The Western forces are attempting a landing at the end of summer 1944. Is it worth intercepting the incoming UK fleet? The general principle is no. The Italian fleet's chances of getting through the UK fleet and to the convoy are slim. Because this happens in the Bay of Biscay, you do get two shots. So you can intercept with one Italian fleet and then intercept with the German surface action afterwards. The odds are a little better, but they're still not great. The more likely outcome is you add a bunch of sorties to the Italian and German forces. A much stronger option is to let the landing go in, wait for the supply phase, then hit the escorted convoys on the way out two or three times, in this case, in each zone, and follow up with the surface action. So, at minimum, that will exhaust the fleets. On the other hand, it's definitely worth spending the tank counter on the Italian unit to give it a 1 in 36 chance of repulsing the landing. A general tactical point worth reiterating in these kind of situations, it is never worth landing directly into the port. Land north, land west of Nantes and attack into the city. Even if the assault fails, the troops are at least ashore and require an Axis reaction of some point, of some kind. And very occasionally I've seen a unit that landed, got repulsed into the city it attacked in, then ended up on low supply the next turn, then succeed on a lucky roll on the next turn and take the city. So, objective achieved. The second landing comes southeast of Cherbourg and uses the Allied Mulberry marker. I'm not sure this is how I would have done it. The two landings can be separately isolated. But isolating the Brest Peninsula makes sense, though that could have been achieved with the second landing northeast of Brest, shielded by the previous landing at Nantes. My counter at Cherbourg doesn't dislodge the unit, and both Brest and Cherbourg will now be out of supply. The UK forces failed to shake Cherbourg, but paratroopers are able to land and seize Brest once I remove the unit. I've marked the ports under UK control here. If they could be held, that would be a fairly substantive landing. Unfortunately, they cannot. The Luftwaffe can be brought in and gradually suppress the fleets in each one to cut the supply and allow them to be retaken. By November, I've reduced the beachhead to just breast. Rondon could have slowed this down with cycling, which I discussed last episode in connection with Norway. If the Allies had, as I suggested, landed northeast of Brest and in the position they did in fact land in and used the Mulberry marker near Brest, they would have had three interconnected ports. Now, it's important to remember how the turn order works. You run supply at the end of your own operations phase and then voluntarily eliminate at the beginning of the common end of turn phases. So let's assume overwhelming Luftwaffe resources that will suppress any fleets to clog up the ports. You land, take three locations, then you run all of the supply through just one fleet, probably the most vulnerable one. That should be able to handle four units. Then you voluntarily eliminate that fleet and convoy so the port is empty. The voluntarily eliminated fleet goes into the eliminated box and then at the end of the turn to the mobilization box. The next turn you sail a fresh fleet in and eliminate an exhausted fleet clogging up another port and rebuild the first fleet that you eliminated and its convoy with four sorties. 
the Axes demolish the fleet you sailed in, so you voluntarily eliminate that and the next one, each time ensuring you have empty ports for which you do need multiple mutually interconnected ports. By this point, the original fleet is back at full strength, and it is the next fleet and convoy to sail into the port. The whole cycle requires five fleets to do the job you would normally expect one to do, but it allows you to achieve and maintain a landing in the face of serious opposing air forces. And it's a key logistical element in the amphibious rules you just need to learn. Both this and Rondom's earlier landing in Norway might have succeeded if he had a better command of cycling and could certainly have tipped the game against me. Okay, so how is my long defence against Sotokahu going? Well, as we saw last time we looked at this game, my Soviets had collapsed in June 1942. Generally speaking, in a historical game, a Soviet collapse in June 1942 would be fairly heavily on the um, Axis victory side of this. It's, it's a pretty much a lost position unless the Axis make serious errors subsequently. But let's rewind and see what the Western forces were doing at the same time. By January 1942, you should have a pretty good idea if the USSR will survive in a historical scenario. And I'm there, and I was pretty clear it wouldn't. In the opening, I succeeded in the main Western objective, which is to keep a toehold in Africa, in this case, in Kuwait. Now I need to expand the region UK forces control. I need Axis forces to be at least eight hexes from the ports so that German air power cannot target the ships. Once I have that, it is best to avoid activating UK units if I can, unless I can get into the desert zone and be launching potentially dangerous attacks. The difficulty for the UK is that they only have 10 production points at this moment. That'll go up to 12 in May when the next round of Lend-Lease hits. But it's vital to recover the various naval and air elements. So you don't want to be spending two production points activating a motorised unit unless you really need to. That theatre interaction that there are threats in one place and another and things are being tied down is really important. I will need those fleets operational because I'm going to need to protect the UK from a potential sea lion while still maintaining my actual units here in North Africa. And it's also a good reason why I should have played conservatively with the USSR once a new collapse was inevitable, to ensure as much time as possible for the UK to operate. Because a UK tank attack in fair weather is potent. It runs a 1 in 36 chance of a DE and an 8 in 36 chance of a DD. That second one is often lethal. I had no actual luck, but a double DD is something that will happen fairly frequently. In April, in anticipation of the USSR collapse, I took prophylactic measures and positioned fleets at Edinburgh and Newcastle. These are out of range of the Luftwaffe and have both the ability to interdict the channel and to counter any attempts to transfer the German convoy from Norway to Antwerp. I also made sure to cover Southampton, which is particularly important. Ideally, should get garrisons into all of the southern ports to prevent any Axis player putting two units ashore with a single surprise attack. You also need to defend Gibraltar. I would say that the textbook play in a historical opening is to spend the political success the Axis game when the USSR collapses to place a pro-Axis marker in Madrid and then try to activate Spain. In fact, this is almost always what every strong player does when the USSR collapses, Spain being probably the most useful ally after Italy because it threatens Gibraltar and thus a medlock. Don't do this by the way, silly rules mistake, I said the US unit to Gibraltar but the US unit can't go into a UK fort, only UK units can do that. Fortunately I switched in a British unit before any attack came. Normally, in a historical scenario, the 1st Canadian and the US task force turn up in July of 1942. These 
double the strength of the Western forces and allow you to spare the WDF or the BEF to defend Gibraltar. So again, another excellent reason, even if the USSR is going to collapse, to try and hold on a few extra months. Despite some lousy rolls, I held on Q I held on in Q8 until October and got the first Canadian ashore. I did, however, get two consecutive political failures, resulting in both Vichy and Ireland activating for the Axis. But I got through 42, holding on in the Med and without a sea lion, so now the tide turns towards the Western forces and we will see if I can recover some ground in 1943 in the next episode. <laughs>